Welcome to People Love Process. This movie is going to document how I take a sketch and build out a brand mark design. Now, before we jump into that, I want to go over how I take my sketches from analog after I've drawn them out and scan them in using a flatbed scanner. Now, I've shown you the flatbed scanner I've used in previous videos, but I haven't really shown you what I do after I scan it. So that's what I'm going to do here. Uh, what you see on screen are all these concepts, and I'll tell you a little more about this project as we move into uh, Illustrator. I can't fully disclose everything because um, I haven't even presented my ideas to my clients yet, and it's a little unique and a little bit different. So uh, this is going to be a little different format than most of my videos. I don't have anything figured out. I haven't worked out typography. Um, I'm just creating uh, brand mark directions because that's what I usually do first. And then I go back and I start pairing it with type. I'm not going to go over all that. Uh, but um, you'll see that in an upcoming movie where I cover that extensively. Uh, so that's uh, something on the horizon you can look forward to. So this, these are a bunch of sketches, not all of them. There's a, a few, a handful more that I have that aren't going to be in this movie. But the theme for this is a T-Rex. And it's a little unique. I can't really disclose what the business is or their name. Uh, but suffice it to say that the owner of the company actually owns a full T-Rex skeleton. And uh, for whatever reason, that's what he wanted to work as his brand mark. Now, they wanted a full skeleton of a T-Rex. And I'm, I explained the best I could that for a brand mark, that's not going to hold up. And if I simplify it down so it would it would look kind of juvenile to work at a smaller size. You, it's just not going to work. But I could possibly work a skull image into something. And so the top left one is uh, one of the directions here. But I also told on, I'm going to show you another thing because we can imply that and it would work better for a brand mark. And that is a T-Rex because that's what the skeleton's based on and uh, do it in a kind of a, a nice graphic uh, simplified way. And that's what a lot of these sketches are. We're not going to build out all of these. We're just going to focus on a couple of them. But when I scan it into my flatbed scanner, you can see I've drawn these on all different pieces of uh, the translucent stock I use from Nina. And then once um, I get them drawn out, um, and I drew a lot more than what's showing here, but for whatever reason, I didn't like those. So these are the ones I'm going forward with. And I cut it out and I tape it up on a sheet of eight and a half by 11 paper and scan it in. I scan it in at 800 PPI. So in case you don't want to rewatch this video, I put that in the exercise file. So you know what uh, resolution it's scanned in. Obviously you can go up to image and you can uh, check out the, the resolution as well. Now I can't remember where it is. I thought it was under here. Of course, I do this all the time, but now that I'm doing well, you can find out, oh, image size here. And you can see it's 800 uh, PPI on the resolution. So I do that because I'm going to blow this out. I don't want to just drop this in as a grayscale file into Illustrator. And so I usually blow it out. And all that takes is having the layers selected and you can use the adjustment layer like levels if you don't want to do it non-destructively like this. I usually drag it out so I can see it. And then I just blow out the white and I'm just trying to get rid of, you know, all the stuff we don't need, which is the tape and everything like that. And I'll blow it out to get rid of most of that. Then I'll drag the left in just to darken it up like this and it's usually this is what I do. Now, I'll go back in on this. So on this this uh, adjustment layer, I might just uh, go ahead and merge down like that. And then I just take like the pencil tool, make sure it's fat enough like this, maybe even fatter. And I, I'll just go in just so it doesn't distract me as I'm building. And I'll just get rid of these edges that show up from the cut paper that I did. 
like this. So it's all the stuff, and I might go in here and just clean up some of the, this This shows me I didn't clean my scanner, uh, the, the glass plate on my scanner. I need to clean that, otherwise it just embeds it. Um, I didn't get it perfect because I dropped a guide down here on the, the raw scan, and this one's okay, but this one's leaning down a little bit, so we'll fix that. So that's how I'll adjust it, get it ready to, a uh, save out is an image I can place in Illustrator and uh, start uh, building my vector art. So I'm going to turn on this layer because these are all the adjustments I made. So I'll turn it on. You'll see we fix this guy down here. So he comes up a little bit and I blew out other areas. But this is the stage I get it to. I was looking at this head and I just didn't like it the more I looked at it. But I like the kind of the attitude and vibe of this one. So I just copied part of that and kind of gave this one, the top right corner, a new head. And I think that looks even better. It looks more aggressive, which I like. And then I don't always do this, but sometimes I do just to test it to see if if I like what it's gonna look like, because this is all gonna be dark, the eyes will be white. This will have dark areas and the color I plan on using uh, which is a play off of their existing brand color, but I'm going to change the value of it. Um, this one we're going to be building, and we're going to be building the skull in the top left. But I might go in just to test and just to drop in fills. And this is just copying those layers and paint bucket, uh, paint bucket filling it. And you can see I did an alternate head here because I handled the detail on the face a little differently on this one. But ultimately, I think this is the one I'm going to go with. So that gives you a rough idea of what the vector art in um, its end result will be. This one will be a little different because the secondary color we'll use in this design will define it and make it work better. And that's the one we're going to focus on. So I just want to show you this because this is how I prepare the drawings before I bring them into Illustrator and I start building. So let's go ahead and we're going to go ahead and uh, go over to Illustrator and you can see this is one of the sketches we're going to build here and like I normally do I go to transparency I'm going to set this for about 20 maybe even 15 percent just so it's visible but it's not kind of getting in the way then I lock it and I don't keep zoomed out like this. I like to zoom in so I can see what I'm doing like this. And on a layer here, we'll start building. Um, I have graphic styles that preload into each new document that I create. And uh, these are all this like 1 point, 0 0.75, 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.25. And this is dots and dashes, just so I don't have to recreate the wheel all the time. We'll start off with 0.5 here. And We'll switch to the pin tool, and this is where I'll just start building. This one isn't so geometric. This one is going to be a lot of uh, pin tool building. Wherever it comes to a point, gets a point. These are easy to uh, discern. Now, on something like this, let's go and undo this, because I'd probably start with the plug-in. I'd start with this arc by points tool, because I can go click, click, like, oops. Let's try that again. Click, click like this and get that curve. But I'd say 90% of this design, actually, I don't like that. So uh, you don't even have to use that. You can go like this. Then as it's coming down here, I want it. Oh, the other thing I need to bring up as I'm working on this video is I got a message about two weeks ago from one of the head engineers at a uh, Adobe Illustrator and they informed me they finally fixed the snapping bug and he asked me to test it and so I had to clarify is it going to be added to the older versions or just the very newest version he said the newest version of Adobe Illustrator 2024 that's the one I'm using as you can see here and so I said well let me use it and I'll get back to you so we're going to actually use this movie as another official test. Now I've been using it just to see and so far so good. Snapping seems to be working the way it did. It just took them 
11 plus years to actually get around to fixing what they broke. So that's unfortunate, but uh, at least they finally did. So I'm kind of happy with that. So we'll see if we run into it as we're building here. We shouldn't because um, it's supposedly fixed. So um, I, I want to trust them, but I'm going to verify. So wherever your art comes to a point, gets a point. These are easy ones to discern. Now, this arch is going to go all the way down to this one. So I'll go ahead and do that. Then I'll go grab the anchor point tool and we can bend and distort this. I'm going to try to do the majority of this. I'll still use the plugins at times, but I'll use the native tools in Illustrator. So you can see none of these curves are perfected yet. I usually lay down all my paths, go back, and then I start... Uh, playing around with it. Now, I like using plugins. So um, I have uh, smart guides turned on. So if you hover over an anchor, you're over an anchor, hover over a path, you're over a path. And that those those are those are helpful. Uh, I go to um, plugins when I want to do things that I really uh, like the features they add. And the path scribe is the exact same type of tool as uh, the anchor point tool. It just pre-existed it by about seven years before Illustrator added the functionality to this one. What I like about it is it adds these white nodes uh, when you hover over a path, and that's a ghost handle, meaning I can just grab that node and pull it out. Boom. It just makes the process so much easier, in my opinion, uh, to use that rather than using even the native methods that Adobe Illustrator has. So I'll finesse these curves to get the profile of the shape. And I'll go down here. I'm going to focus on this one. I notice I don't have one of my tools in here, so it's putting my icons in a different position. I need to eventually change that so it's throwing me off a little bit because i'm going to where my muscle memory goes to for like 15 years and it's in a slightly different position um, it's amazing how much you can add to muscle memory and then if something changes or you update your software and they change the icons or whatever it's like oh ah! you feel lost for a little bit so i'm just going to adjust this And what, you know, I think I'm going to go to a thinner line. Yeah, it makes it easier to see. I think that looks good. Now, the reason why I built it here instead of going to his neck and sticking with the perimeter is because I want to be able to have this to define that when I get to the point of doing the shadows. So what I'm going to do is clone this. And I will go to the scissor tool and I'm just going to cut this. Then I'll delete the rest of the path. And on this cut path, I'm just going to move it to my temp layer. That's why I have that there. Then I'll come back here and I'll cut this where I would have stopped if I was going to do it from the neck. And then I'll continue building. So we'll go like this. We'll go down here, something right about here. Gets here. Again, I'm not going to worry about the exact. We can zoom out a little bit. Not going to worry about the exact curves. I'll go back and fix it. I think this could be all one Bezier curve. Then think three o'clock position where it comes to a point, gets a point. This would be like a another three o'clock position. What I'm saying is I'm using the clockwork method that I've covered in previous videos. And the only reason I ever came up with that methodology was um, when a local college asked me to teach digital illustration and I had to figure out a way to explain to students how to think when you're uh, building your vector art. And so I used the analogy of a clock. And that helps you to discern where to place anchor points. So, um, cause not actually not when you're dealing with like geometric type anchors are almost always going to be on, on the, uh, what are called tangents. 
Um, it's not so when you're creating something more free form. Um, at times, it even works better not doing tangents and uh, just uh, doing it on an angle because it, it's easier to control and it just looks better. Um, but uh, thinking like a clock will help you. Now, this style is pretty graphic, but wherever it comes to point, gets a point. And if this isn't too long of a path in between two anchors, uh, you don't need any anchors in this part. You can do all that with the Bezier handles to form the in curve on that. Same with the T-Rex toes, you know? I don't think I've ever said that sentence in my entire life, T-Rex toes. Uh, but we can create that with the Bezier curve. We don't need to put in our anchor in there. This one, I'd probably do about like that. Then as it comes up here, this will be like a nine o'clock position on a clock. And I pulled that handle out way too far. So I'll pull that back and we'll finesse those as we make a second pass. And we'll go in here. Oops, I think I'll zoom in now. Continue where we left off. Wherever it comes, a point gets a point. All these are such short paths. We can just put our anchors right on the end where it comes to a point because this can be made pulling this handle out and pulling this handle out. So we'll go right up to where his little arms go into his body. It's funny how a T-Rex is kind of fierce looking beast, but then its arms look like, I don't know, looks like Ewok arms or whatever. Okay, let's uh, go ahead and adjust this, grab the wrong tool, pull the handles out. Love those ghost handles. I, I like the name. I like that they call them ghost handles. It's just it's it's creative but it's accurate that's why i like it like this little ghost handle Doop. control that uh just that looks pretty good i think i might tweak this a little bit looks a little too straight and i'll pull this one down and this is a good example where it wants to snap to that path because a smart guide so i'm going to undo what i just did i'm going to go Command U to turn off smart guides just so I can do this little bit of finessing. It won't try to snap like that. So as you use smart guides, you're going to have to turn them on and off because they will get in the way at times. But at times you want them on because they'll help you snap things. So, uh, so far, I'm, I haven't, I'm not doing a whole lot of geometric building on this uh, using basic shapes. It's all freeform building with the, the pin tool. And by the way, you know, I, I see a lot. How do I put this with just not sounding like a, like a pin tool geezer, or whatever. Uh, I see a lot of um, uh, reels on uh, Instagram specifically. I don't use TikTok, but I'm sure they're on there too. Um, that will show every tool in Illustrator as if it's, you know, the best thing since sliced bread. And one of them is the curvature tool and singing the praises of it. Adobe, um, they consulted with me on the on the curvature tool. And when they first showed me, it was an engineer with his laptop and it was in beta and nobody knew about it. And he let me sit down and try it. And I go, I look at him, I just said, why? And he goes, what do you mean? And I go, well, is are you gonna make this like a modifier key on the pin tool? So as we're building, we can utilize this, this feature. That'd be kind of cool. I might start using it. That, no, it's a separate tool. And that's kind of the way they think. Everything's a separate tool. doesn't need to be. They, they could have integrated it into the pin tool, but because they don't create, they don't think that way. And I'm just going, it might be useful, but if you learn how to use the pin tool and figure out how to know the principle behind how the pin tool works, 
you never need the curvature tool. It's not needed. It's like, and it doesn't really create better art. It's like a handicap to try to create better art and try to dumb down the process. Well, it, it, it how would I put this without sounding, sounding like a coot? Well, I would say just learn how to do the pin tool well, and you'll never need uh, the curvature tool. I think this one needs to go down to control this curve better. That looks way better like that. That's looking good. And then on these, these are easy. These are, again, the ghost handle. This is like a shallow backwards S kind of curve. And then we'll just pull this bezier handle in like that. That looks good. And we'll pull this one in. And then on this, we'll use the bottom to create the back part of the foot. This might look a little wonky. So once again, this is a good time to have smart guides turned off so it's not trying to snap every time you get by a path. Now, this one, I think I might have put it in the wrong location. and. Uh, unfortunately, this feature isn't in Illustrator, even though Illustrator has tried to buy uh, Stu Graphics like at least two times, but uh, they they don't sell it. Um, here's the uh, reposition anchor point. I think that's what it's called. Reposition point tool. Um, again, I call this the Vaughn tool because this was an idea that I requested and they actually uh, developed it, which it's it's a great one. And I use it just for I showed you there where I wanted to slide it in. It finds the tangents. So um, and you can see this tangent. Don't think of a circle with the tangent being 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock and 9 o'clock. This is finding a tangent at an angle. And that's kind of what I meant when I was saying tangents aren't exactly like what you're going to see on geometric shapes. Uh, there's still technically a tangent, but sometimes, as in this case, it looks better at an angle. Okay, we'll go back and I'll grab this tool or maybe just the ghost handles and I'll control the T-Rex toe like that. We'll go up here. Make this little cut in area on his body it's pretty cool I got to see the the skeleton that the owner of this business or founder probably one and the same um, owns and it's kind of touring the world now And I actually, I don't know if I've ever talked about this in any movie or anything. I know I posted an image or a video on Instagram about it before, but back in 2008, I was on the illustration board for the next illustration, National Illustration Conference called ICON. And Every month for about six months, we would all fly into New York and we'd meet at uh, the New York Hotel. And then we, uh, that's where we stayed. And then we did our meetings in the Society of Illustrators building in New York, which is just like, think if uh, the illustration world had the equivalent of Hogwarts for people who love illustration. It's really cool. Uh, all these just, just legendary illustrators and they have pictures of them on the wall. It'd be really cool if they could talk like it did in Hogwarts, but that's where we met. Um, and uh, the whole reason, why am I bringing up? <laughs> now I forgot why I brought up the story. Um, oh, oh, that's right. So the reason why I'm bringing up this story is there was a couple uh, who were acting as our logistics coordinators for our conference. And they did they do conferences all the time. Normally, it's like couples conferences, but they have the experience of uh, taking care of logistics and making sure everything's in place for the location that we're going to have the event at. And 
we all went out to dinner one night and I was sitting by the husband and I was talking to him and and I say, so I go, and he mentioned something about conferences are seasonal. And I'm going, well, that's interesting. I didn't really think of that, but I guess that'd be true. And I go, so what do you do in the off season? Do you just, you make all your money during that season and then that carries you through? And he goes, oh no, we, uh, I fly to Siberia and I buy fossils. <laughs> and I'm like, what? You do what? And he goes, yeah, we go, me and my wife fly to Siberia. Well, I think it's just him. I don't think his wife goes on those trips, but he flies to Siberia and he buys either woolly mammoth fossils or woolly rhinoceros uh, fossils. And I'm going, really? And I've always been curious about archaeology, so it fascinated me. And he goes, here, I'll show you. And he takes out his iPhone and he starts showing me his website where he sells these fossils. And I go, well, who buys these? And he goes, well, we, we um, what do you call it? Not restore them. Yeah, restoration, I guess, where he takes them in its raw form and then he cleans them up and he puts them back together. So it's museum quality displays and that looks really good for a perimeter. So I think we're getting close here. And anyway, I'm looking at his website on his phone and right there is a, he has one that looked like it was in a case. And I go, what's that? And he's going, well, that's, that's a woolly mammoth fossil, but it's, um, it's just a, a tusk. And I go, God, that's cool. I go, but who did the sculpture you have in it? Because it was like carved into this, think of if you have a full tusk, this was like a third of it. And it was standing with the point going up and it's kind of broken because it's a fossil. But he had a Siberian artist carve a woolly mammoth out of the bottom part. So it's a piece of art, but it's a fossil that dates back, I don't know, I think the, the he gave me um, the form of authenticity that gives, I forget the term they, they, there's a term for documenting, um, the ownership of, uh, kind of a, a piece of artwork or, a, or in this case, a fossil. So you know where it came from and that it's not fake. And, um, and the reason why he gave it to me is because I bought it from him. He gave me a deal and it's sitting in my office. It's really cool. And um, I'll put an image in the exercise files for, for this movie so everybody can see it. So so I like, I it, it was just fast. It's a fast, he had so many cool stories. He was kind of kind of an eccentric guy in a way. Like I remember one weird thing is that we were ordering drinks and he kept like insisting to the waiter, you know, I don't, please just bring me a glass of warm water. I don't want any ice in it. And I'm going, dude, it's summer and it's hot. Why do you not want ice? You know, and, and I always get curious about stuff like that. So I had to ask him, I go, so what, what is this? Um, what's up with not getting ice? I think I need one more anchor there. So we're going to put one here. And he goes, well, from if it's been years, I mean, it's been a long time since I talked to him about this, but um, he explained it as uh, ice water, sh it's like shocks the gut or whatever, and you get better um, hydration if you don't drink ice water. I don't know if it's true. I've never had that problem. I love cold water, ice water, but okay, that's kind of a rabbit, <laughs> rabbit trail story. Um, okay, so I'm just working out the mouth. I kind of hyper-focus on areas like this. So 
uh, ultimately what I'm going to be doing is I want to keep this shape as is. So I'm going to clone it. And this is where I'll move it up to my X layer and store it because I don't want to, I don't want to lose that. But at this point, I do want to take, let's see, I do want to take this one and I'll clone it and I'll take this shape and we'll go intersect with Pathfinder because I want it to look like that. And now we'll focus on creating the other elements in this. And I'll use the arc by points tool on this one. I don't like having anything perfectly straight, so I like having a little curve to everything. It's just, I don't know, it's my personal preference. I think it just looks better. And of course, we'll just use elliptical shape because why try to build that with the pin tool? It'd be kind of pointless like that. And then I'll create a throwaway shape just to trim off that piece like that. Fuse those two together. Again, we can go up to elliptical shape and create the nostril. Clone it. Ah, didn't mean to do that. And drag this over. With that on top, I can trim that shape to get his nostril. We'll do this little shadow area down here like that. I'm going to snap to the bottom of his chin here. These are all just arcs, so that's why I'm using the arc plugin. Then I don't have to finesse with any of those anchor points. That's why I love this tool. It just saves, saves so much time. Like that and then on this one I'll do the old-fashioned way with the pin tool like that but then I'll get to this point and I'll go back to the plugin so I use both and then I'm going to go from here to right about there This I'm going to have to adjust. That looks good. Now on this one, I'm probably going to have to have an anchor down here. So I'll add an anchor, bring it down to here. And if you want this, this is a corner anchor point. You can just go up here and you hit smooth and it'll add those handles will pop out on each side. But I need to get this handle to go this way so it puts some volume at the top. And then we can adjust this to swoop up. I don't want that to get too thin. I think that looks okay. Like that. Again, this is where I'll go grab another plug in keep going to the wrong spot, reposition, then I'll move it. And with the reposition, it shows you all the tangents that are on this path. And we're going to go down to the bottom here like that. But see, even though this is the right tangent, this makes it look kind of flat. And if I undo that, I think that looks better. So I think what I want to do, so I want to put it like right about here. And then I'll adjust this one, adjust this one, and then I'll grab this handle and adjust that. I think that looks better. 
all kind of really like like if you saw my head I'm turning my head to the side because I think that looks fine okay and now I'm gonna go back to um, the temp file we have here where I have this one but what I'm gonna do is cut it right at this anchor point here oops let's turn on smart guides here we don't need this part of it we can just get rid of that and then I'll go ahead and just continue out here and close it to that shape that we just created goes all the way down to here that's fine and then I'll continue building the shadow like this using the arc plugin so you can see the his one arm that's kind of one of the hardest things to do when you're dealing with the design uh, is when if it's an animal or a person and their arm or their leg overlaps part of their body you really have to figure out how am I going to do that so it reads right um, and in this case I'm using the shadow to define his arm because I don't have the luxury of it being silhouetted on the edge or like down here with the legs so that makes it kind of that's what the challenge was on this one is how do I handle that and at times I'll try stuff and then when I go to build it I realize yeah that's not gonna work too great even though I thought it would so you never know until you start um, like you could get this far and then at the next stage realize oh that doesn't work so hot so that's that's pretty normal okay here's one where I don't want that so I'll smart remove that and I'll use this handle to distort it and this handle this one can come back in and we'll pull this one out a little more that looks okay There's been a lot of memes over the years about T-Rex arms. Okay. I'll come back and adjust that one. Let's just get the shadow built. I'm glad YouTube has channels because this is where, oops, this channel will be building shading or whatever I name it and that way you don't need to watch you don't need to watch the whole thing you could watch you know a minute or two and get the idea and then go to the next stage like that I think that looks okay and on these these are going to come to a pretty sharp points so these were I'd probably go in and I'll round off some of that but not at this stage I'll make that decision later uh, here's one thing I'll do here on this one I'll create that curve and I'll pay attention to this curve and we'll deal with that in a little bit and then anything as I'm building like this I see something I go oh that would be easier if I just use the elliptical shape this is another shallow s curve so we'll just hop all the way down here and then i'll build this little inset for this kind of rim lighting on the toe like that then i'll go back Actually, let's go ahead and just finish this here.
and then I'll go back in, I'll smart remove these. Now I use a plugin. If you want to smart remove with Illustrator, you can now. It just takes a little longer. And once again, this is something they should have made a one button push, but you have to highlight the anchor. Then you have to click on this minus anchor point tool. Then you have to hold down shift. And then if you click it, it'll smart remove it. That should have been just a simple modifier key on the current tool you're using, which is the pin tool, and you just click it, disappears. And that that's the part that kind of bugs me about Illustrator is they don't simplify things. They make it obtuse at times. Okay, let's go ahead and finish off the shading. So we'll create this shadow on the back part. Bring this in with the Bezier handle to create that elegant curve. That looks good. I'm going to zoom out. Okay. It'll go pretty fast once we get the rest of this built. So I'm going to go down. I'm going to hop over to this point and I'll start here. Like that. And I'll go back to the arch tool. I think what I'm going to do is just visually make it look like it goes from his belly up to his side, like that. And then I'll just cut it here, get rid of that. Again, this is like, just think of a shallow S shape because it'll bend back in as it gets down here. Create this inset. And I think on this one, I'm gonna use the pin tool. And then it comes down here. Then I'll switch back to that arch. Smart remove this. Then I'm going to pull this this way and then adjust this. That looks good. Let's go ahead and adjust this one. Again, if you once again, if you want to do this with the anchor point tool, you can like that. That'll reveal the Bezier handles. And this is a long enough line, it seems like, that we need another anchor point midstream to transition that curve better and control it. So it's all about having enough to control it, but you don't want to get too many. And that's another thing I don't like about the curvature tool. It tends to add too many anchors, in my opinion. Okay, so... Let's go ahead and just select our shadow here. We'll color it blue outline so we can see where it uh, stands out like that. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and close it down here so we have all that enclosed. Like that, all oh, that's fine. And now, because we have it enclosed, I'm going to go back to the areas like this, and we'll use elliptical shapes. So I'll kind of eyeball the center, do an elliptical shape, rotate it. Ah. I can tell they still haven't fixed that flickering cursor. That's annoying. I don't know why it does that. Um, let me make this a little beefier. Increase the width. So 
something like that. Select this and go minus front. Undo it. I think I have this curve off a little bit. I'm going to adjust it. That looks better. I think I like that better. And finesse it. There we go. Go into this one. And we'll use the ghost handles to pull out these curves. This one can go down a bit. I think that looks pretty good. So what I'll do now is I'll take the perimeter of the body. I'll clone it, Command-C, Command-F. If you have the contextual menu bar open, you can select the shape and click the duplicate key. It'll do the same thing. I just have that feature turned off. It, it gets in my way, I've, I've found. Actually, before we do that, let's select everything, make a copy of it, and I'm just going to drag it to the X layer so I can always go back. But we do have a copy of the body, so I'll select that. I'll select the shading shape we did, and we'll go intersect, intersect wherever it... Um, oh, you know what? I forgot to... Let's go ahead and build the tail shading. I forgot to do that. Duh. Okay. Um, we'll build it in blue. Start here. That. We have this bending two different ways, so I'll just use the pin tool. I think I'll just go ahead and use the pin tool. Where's our anchor over here? Right there. So I'll put it right about here. And then somewhere down there it'll end. Then we'll just close this shape. This one I want it to bend in. This one will bend out, this will bend in, this will bend out. Okay, and then on this one, I'm going to try something, I'm just going to smart remove. Ooh. Look how nice that looks. You don't need that. So, and do you see how fast that went on Smart Remove with the plugins? Just like instantaneous. That's why I tend to use that. I don't use the Smart Remove because Smart Remove by Astute Graphics was around literally a decade before uh, Adobe put their version in. And theirs is like two, three steps. It's ridiculous. It should be simplified or at least give you the ability to create a keyboard shortcut so you could make it a one button push. That would be nice. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and take this and just clone it and move it to my X layer. Then I'm gonna take my shading, take the tail shading, we'll unite it, check appearance, cause it'll default to a group. I want this to be a compound. I'll select the copy of the body perimeter we have the shading shape and I'll go intersect wherever those overlap will create a new shape and you can see that's what we have here. It will default back to a group so I'm going to change that back to um, a compound path like that and we just have the teeth to build then we can colorize it and do the detailing and let's go ahead and focus on the mouth now. So I have this shape. I'm going to copy it color blue. I'm just going to bring it down. We're going to use this as the top of the teeth shape. And then all I have to do, uh, didn't want that. I want the arc tool. Then we'll come down here. And I'll just, none of these will be straight. These are his teeth. And actually, I'm making my t I'm taking artistic license here because the T-Rex teeth 
are um they have a lot more teeth than this let's just put it that way but this is going to be a brand mark so i want to simplify it and you know deduce it down into a more iconic form that represents what we want it to be which is a t-rex but not as complex as what a real t-rex would be because that's not going to be ideal And you can see I don't have to finesse with any of the Bezier curves since I'm using the Arc by Points plugin. Once I get that, then I can just create the closed shape. It can be anything like that. I'll select this, select this one. We'll go Intersect. It'll default to a group again, so I'm going to change it to compound. Then I'll take this inner shape we have for the shadowing area, and I'll clone it, make a copy of that, select the teeth, and go intersect again to trim off that end. Again, it's going to divert uh, to a group, so I always make sure to have a keyboard shortcut. If you don't use keyboard shortcuts, watch my creating with keyboard shortcuts. There's a free chapter in the exercise files. Uh, that shows you um, how to set those up. I go over it in the video, obviously, but um, I have charts and everything, so it'll help you. Okay, I think uh, this is good enough to start building out the final brand mark. So I'm going to take this again. I'm going to copy it, usually group it, and then I move it to my X layers. I can always go back to it if I ever want to. Um, the brand color for this specific brand is like a red. Uh, it's actually maroon, and both the art director and me don't think that's going to work great on this. It's a little too dark. It needs to be, in my opinion, more vibrant. So I'm thinking I'm going to retain this within the context of like um, a square or a squarish type of shape. Um, doesn't have to be a perfect square. I think it'll be a little wider. And then I'm thinking the head, at least on the top area, will pop out kind of like that. So I'm going to turn off my sketch at this point. And I'll select the areas that are going to be the shadow areas. And at this point, I'm not setting up final artwork. I'm, I'm getting it to a point where it visually will represent what a final mark would look like if they choose to go that, that way. And then if they choose that, then I'll go back in and do production if I need to do that. So it's like a print-ready brand graphic asset that they can use in whatever context. Uh, I'll go ahead and unite these. Make sure it's a compound path. And right now, I'm going to go ahead and we'll color this one. Let's go to polar colors down here. We'll fill it with a red. I'll take this. This is going to be white. Uh, not white line, white fill. Like that. And then all of these... will be a, for lack of a, maybe, we'll try that for right now. I might change that as we come back to it. Teeth need to be white. This is too cold, so I think we'll go like that. I'm going to take this. I'm going to give it an outline. I'm going to go to strokes. Right now, the outline is um, dividing the line. I'm going to send that to the back of the fill shape. Then I'll create a thickness that I think works well. So this is four points from the edge of the shape outward for the outline. So um, it's nice using these to do this, this kind of look. But I'm going to copy that shape over here 
and I'll fill it with the same color. That way I can select this, sample this one, and it'll actually, ah, I didn't mean to delete it. I meant to, I meant to go commands, <laughs> command C. Okay, like that. Um, I'm not sure if this is the right thickness, but what I'm going to do is I'll just commit to it at this point since we're just kind of experimenting as we're building. And by the way, I have a general idea in my mind, actually. I do want to round it so it doesn't, um, I don't want it to uh, come to a sharp point like this. I want it to be subtly rounded like that. Let's go ahead and color this differently just so you can see what I'm doing here. And I'm going to go right now. Uh, we'll go outline stroke, and then I'll just unite both of those. You'll see you'll get all these artifacts, and this is where Illustrator is kind of silly. Uh, it should be smart enough. They have, you know, they have um, AI or Sensei, whatever they want to call it. It should know you don't need this. Well, if you want to get rid of this, just double click in isolation mode, Command A, deselect the outermost perimeter shape, and just hit delete. That way, you just have that. This is what it should produce, but for whatever reason, it doesn't. So like that, oops, no outline. We'll just fill this now. Fill this with the color. I'll copy it. I'll select our T-Rex guy and paste it behind Command B. I'm gonna get rid of this outline now on this shape. So we'll just go nothing like that. And the reason why I did that is because I wanna be able to take this shape and we'll fill this with blue take the shape here and i'm going to trim it that way it aligns with the background shape it's going to come to the foreground so we'll just copy and command b paste behind our element like that this might look better in black now that i'm thinking about it see i'm not completely sold on how to handle the color yet on this one I, I i i keep going back to gray i keep thinking gray so i'm gonna try gray again see these are the things i try to figure out before i i i try to um Although that's, maybe if I make this back out. No, I don't like that. Okay. Well, anyway, I know these are four, so I'm going <coughs> to do something here. I'm going to go ahead and just create a, a rectangle. And by the way, all this snapping I'm doing, I'm not running into any problems, so that's awesome seems to be finally fixed which is just i'm thrilled that it's finally fixed i just don't think it should have taken almost 12 years to do it um i was going to do a shape blend but i want to try something and it's a little Okay, let's do this. And it probably won't work spacing-wise exactly. But we'll select these shapes and... I'm going to, let's see, distribute. I have to admit, I've never used this distribute. I was I was going to try it on this, but you know, I think I'm just going to do it the old-fashioned way. And the person who watches these, you know who you are. Uh, she always gives me good advice, so you can clue me in on this because, um, frankly, I don't do it enough to even need to use distribute spacing. But there is a way to do it. It's unfortunately. That's something I need to learn how to do because I never do it that way. 
So I usually, um, let's go ahead and copy this, snap it, and then I'll bring it down like this. Then I usually copy this, and this is like the really antiquated way of doing it, you know. It's an idea I had in my head, and I originally sketched out in a, in a uh, kind of a doodled way. So I don't even know if it's going to work, but we'll try it. Copy this. And even though the concept of the kind of a T-Rex, in my opinion, doesn't completely align with what the company does per se. Um, I think it'll, this will kind of give it, I don't know how to say it, an aesthetic that would appeal to the industry it will be used in. Okay, now I'll just go back and select all these. Boy, snapping really is working pretty solid. So that's, there's so many times when I was doing stuff like this and, and it's always geometric stuff. Let's go ahead and get rid of this one, paste this back in and so I'm going to get rid of these two. We don't need them. And I'm going to go ahead and drag this up then snap it to the base here. And you can see that our, ah, our red box in the background is a little short. So I'll select those anchors and I'll put it like this. Maybe even go down here like this. I'm gonna try something now. I'm going to, this doesn't have to be perfect because we're just creating a comp. Take these, trim these, copy this, paste it behind the outline we have like this. I just, maybe not white, maybe, Oh, maybe a tint. Let's try a tint. Okay. I'm not so sure. Well, you know what? I'm not going to delete it. I'll just again move it to my junk layer. Okay. I don't think I'm <laughs> I don't think I'm going to go in that direction. Okay. So, I guess what you know, maybe this these colors still I don't have a lot of black, yeah. That's a little more vibrant. Maybe this just needs to be darker, just not black. Or maybe it just needs to be black. Okay, that's not looking bad. But I'm thinking this needs to be thicker now. Okay. We're getting there. This is a good example where I'm probably going to set this, get it to a point where I go, okay, it just it looks okay. I like it better with a thicker outline, especially since that kind of line conversion type of thing. That's not going to work. So I do that all the time, though. I'll try stuff. We'll just trim this off. Like that, it'll come to front. So we'll send this to the back. So maybe, maybe on this one. Oh, I like that. Maybe the proportionate square would work. 
Oh yeah, there we go. Okay, okay, now that's, that was it. It was too contained. That, I actually like that. I don't know if I'll go with a stark black, but um, I'm going to save this, group it, and move this to my X layer. Uh, the thing I would do next, and let's go ahead and make a copy of this. So I'll duplicate this, and we'll just call this rounding for no better reason, because this is where I would go in, and I wouldn't leave everything sharp like this. I'd go in and I'd use the, you can use the corner widget. You can do everything I'm going to show you with the corner widget. I just prefer using um, uh, Astute Graphics uh, dynamic corners because I don't have to select anything. It detects where a round can be or where a round can be removed. So I'll just hover over the anchor and you can see it's absurdly saying rounded this far. No, I just want to add a little round like that. And then if I can go ahead and click off and I like it, it's sharp still, but it's not like digitally like poke out your eyes sharp. And it remembers the last one you used, so I can click on other anchors here, like on the mouth and the back, and apply that same round. So that way the continuity of my detailing uh, will align. And I go through on all of these and I just add that kind of, uh, kind of blunt the tip of these sharp um, vertices on the vector shapes. And this is what really buttons up a design. And then when it gets into an area like this, I do the same thing on the negative areas, especially on the talons, even on his little elbow here. And I do it on the perimeter, et cetera. So I'm not going to go through all those, but I just wanted to show you that because um, this, I think, looks better than leaving it dagger sharp. And I'd even go in on some of the other ones, like I go in on areas at the top of the head here. And sorry, I grabbed the wrong plugin. And I'd add a little round there, like that. I do that. I do it on his teeth too, so it's not perfectly. It, it would still be sharp visually, but it's not that dagger digital sharp that a uh, vector provides. So um, I think that looks pretty good. And this will actually go good with the typography. Let me let me try that darker red. Now that I'm looking at it, that might be a little too. I I like both of them. You know, I might, I, I told her I was going to suggest other colors too. So, um, you know, I might do a really dark red, a, a really deep red orange of sorts. I guess we can experiment really quickly. I didn't intend to cover any of this, but oops, I meant to go to color, go here. We'll add a lot of red. You know, that doesn't look bad either. So it's very uh, kind of like an orangish red. Now I'll drag this down here just to save it, but I might go back. This just, it, it, maybe it's just that this has a little too much black in it. Let's just only have five. Yeah, I like that better. Okay, so that's that one. Uh, this was the other sketch. And this is to approach a different direction I have in mind where I take the name of the company, which has the letter O in it. And this, I think, might work in a circular shape. Uh, so I will go ahead and build this out. And uh, we'll just go from there and see it happens. I'm going to add another layer. I always like having medium blue. Um, so if you ever wondered why all of my highlight colors for my layers are that, it's just because that's kind of what I prefer. Let's go ahead and build this one out. We're going to use that arc by points tool. And so I'm going to create this. Now, once again, I'm using these elements that almost look like lightning bolts to, um, 
uh, kind of reinforce what this this company does. That's I'm using them in a conceptual way, and to also create what I think might be a pretty engaging um, brand mark as well, like that. And again, I don't want these perfectly straight lines. I want it to be so ever so subtle, like that. I was watching a documentary one time where this guy is a fossil hunter, and he went to a a ranch property and asked the owner, hey, could I walk your property? And he told them what he does. And if I find anything, I'll tell you. And would you go, I'll do all the work. And then if we discover anything, you know, we can split the cost. The farmer said, sure. So guy walked the property and like the first day he's there walking the property, this is a case where I go up and pretend to come to a point here and create the curve because I can come back and round, get that round. And anyways, walk in the property. Actually, I'm going to redo that. I didn't put it far enough. I think it needs to go right about there. And he saw a bone sticking out of the side of a little hill on the property and he starts investigating it. He ends up finding two T-Rex fossils that must of kind of, they either, they, they summarize it either, well, they summarize that they killed each other battling each other. And so they're interlocked and dead obviously dead through fossils, duh. Um, <laughs> and uh, I just, it's a really cool story. They got the, and they have it all constructed now. And I don't know, they have it all constructed, but it's like they have nobody who wants to buy it. And I, I'd think, why wouldn't a museum buy it? And you think about it, there's only so many museums and, you know, there's probably millions of fossils if they start digging everywhere they'd find fossils so many fossils anyway i just thought it was an interesting story i find archaeology just kind of fascinating it's kind of like treasure hunting of sorts but you uncover stuff about you know past ages and species and it's just really interesting Back in 2010, a couple friends of mine, uh, they were going to go to Europe and Israel and Jordan to go to um, Petra. And uh, one of them had to back out, and they, they basically had a free ticket. I just had to, I forget how much I had to pay for this or that, and I go, yeah, I'll go. So I went, and... God, that was such a fun trip. One of the days they took us, it was southeast, no, southwest of Jerusalem. It was an archaeology dig of an old Roman compound. And um, they let us do digging under there, which was, I was kind of surprised. And that was like, that was so cool. And then they showed us all these artifacts they found. All the artifacts are... Um, the Romans, when they their um, troops would come into that area, because at one point they they controlled uh, Israel and Jerusalem back in the time of Christ specifically, and a little past that, um, when they'd move out of an area or move into an area, they would dig underground caverns, and that's where they live because they keep them warm uh, in winter and cool in the summertime. And when they'd leave, they'd fill them in. 
And that's what this archaeological dig was. It was uncovering an old compound, and they found jewelry and vases and all kinds of things in it. It was kind of cool. Then I remember one time we were in Caesarea, and I was just walking by this Roman aqueduct that they had built there. And there is an amphitheater the Romans had built. And just walking on the beach, because it's really close to the shore, and I'm like seeing these pottery pieces on the ground. And so I go over to our guide, or the 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 person at that location who's not a guide, he's um almost like the equivalent of a park ranger here in the States. And I was asking him, I go, what, what are these artifacts just on the beach? And he goes, oh, those are, those come from the time period. Those are just broken pieces of pottery and other things that they're everywhere here. And so I just asked him, I go, is it okay to take some of these? And he said, yeah, you can grab some. And so like, I have a whole Ziploc bag of, of stuff I collected while I was there. That is the part that is, I don't know, the funnest part for me. Like I remember one Roman archaeological, or one, it was an archaeological dig, but it was a Roman city um, that they unearthed outside, I forget exactly where it was located in Israel, but uh, there was a bathroom, like a, well, it was like a bathing room that they uncovered and it had all this cool mosaic work on the ground. So I was able to get some really cool photographs and turn it into a texture so you can overlay it on stuff and it makes it look like it's a mosaic. So a lot of, you know, I'm having fun doing that. So we're at this place and I'm with this whole group. There's a lot of, a lot of people in the group I didn't know, but they were elderly or whatever. And they're just standing around listening to the guy talk Meantime, I'm going around taking texture pictures everywhere because they were everywhere. So they're looking at me like, why is he so close to the wall? And what's he doing? And it took a while to explain it to him. I go, well, see, I use these in design and stuff. But you have to be willing to seem a little weird to do creative things at times. That's the point I'm getting to. Ah! This one plugin, every now and then, kind of it wants to do another feature from another another tool that's part of the same plugin. Okay, then I get rid of this guy. We're almost there. We'll just go ahead and build this shape. Now, this shape here, let's just do this with the pin tool. This one come all the way to a point because we can do that curve with the rounding tool. Like this, this will probably have one right about here. Come to a point, get a point, come to a point, get a point, so on and so forth. And we can zoom in. I can use the anchor point tool in AI and just finesse these curves to get the curves I want, like this. Here. There's an archeology span magazine I used to subscribe to. And uh, they had a really cool story where it was actually a guy who lives in Oregon and he's in his backyard and he's digging a ditch for something. I don't know, like fixing, I'm gonna fix this smart one or this smooth one. I broke it. Um, he's digging a ditch in his backyard and then he started uncovering like, and, and it was an area where nobody had ever lived. It was like, it wasn't like a neighborhood or anything like this. It was out in the middle of nowhere. And he uncovered all these fossilized clams. 
he didn't know what any of it was or why clams were, you know, basically in his backyard. And they brought in um, some archaeology people and they realized it was from the last ice age. I don't know, stuff like that just, it's just kind of, it's interesting how they can figure, how they figure out um, how things come about like that. It's like they have to solve a archeological mystery. Okay, that looks good. Uh, we'll just do the teeth and this one, I know it's gonna it's gonna work for what I'm gonna do. Actually, let's go one, two, three, four, five, six. We'll take this one, clone it. One, two, three, four, five, six. By the way, I saw a new keyboard that. I'm gonna color these so we know they're not the skull. They're just gonna be used for the teeth. Um, puts the the nudge keys and the the keyboard like I, I like using keyboards that have uh, the number pad on them because you can program those and make them do whatever you want so it kind of expands the the usability of the keyboard and then I saw a video the other day of I forget what the brand was but they have a left-handed keyboard so you can get one that's left-handed. It's the same as the right-handed keyboard, but it puts the numbers on the opposite side. And it would actually benefit anybody who uses the keyboard, you know, who has, um, who's gone ahead and mapped uh, commands and stuff to those keys, uh, because that way, if you're right-handed, you can still have the mouse held down and then use your left hand to punch keys and it'd be a really quick way to do um keyboard shortcuts and everything and i, I was like oh that's actually a good idea but the style of the keyboard it doesn't look low profile like what max have now it looks like kind of your old kind of clunky crt day computers with the big old fat keys that kind of make a bunch of noise. So that's the only thing I was going, well, once they can come up with that, with, you know, the nicer, flat, low profile, kind of quiet keys. Um, my daughter streams and I've snuck into her Twitch channel every now and then just to watch her. And she does it from a PC she has. And it's just her... She's typing, it just sounds like a machine gun going off. It's like, the keyboards are so loud. Okay, almost there, just a few more, a few more prehistoric molars. I'm trying to get a start on uh, this project. It's all my comps are due in about a week. And so I decided to record this on a weekend uh, to kind of get a head start. I'll close this path like that. Then I can take this one, this one. We just want to make sure these two shapes are in front. We'll fill it. So they are, so I can take uh, this top shape, these teeth, go Pathfinder, go minus front, trims it, take this one, same thing, minus front. And then these are gonna be grouped, so I turn these both into compound paths using keyboard shortcuts. So that looks pretty good. All I'm gonna do do now is select all the perimeter shapes, the skull, kind of the lightning shapes, the teeth, all these. I'll go unite like that. Take all the interior shapes, which are the holes in the skull. Unite those. Make sure they're in front of the other shapes. Select everything, minus front. 
And now we have our final skull shape. Get rid of the outline. I'm going to take a circle. Let's go ahead and zoom in a little bit. Oops. I need to see what I'm doing. Let's go to graphic styles. Like, ooh, I almost nailed it. That's... Might go a little smaller with the circle. Paste behind, take that same red we're using on the other one, we'll do a fill. And then on this one, we'll do white. So that's kind of a unique looking mark. I'd still do the same thing where I go in on this and do the subtle rounds. On this design, I might go in and do subtle, like lighter hue of gray, just to add a little bit of shading. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. I'd just have to try it. I did definitely try it, but I'm not going to do that here. And the reason why I came up with this idea is because their name has the letter O in it. So I'll have a version that will have this brand mark and then their name off to the right or this brand mark and their name underneath but i also want to do a version that has their name and this just replaces the o in that part of the name and that way it gives them three variations of their brand identity so uh just wanted to share this process with you i've been designing logos for over three decades now for small business and startups and large corporations and multinational brands, but I've never designed a dinosaur logo. That's kind of surprising. So this was my very first attempt to do it, the very first sketch of my first attempt to do it, that is. And I wanted to document it in this video for this channel. I've shared some insight into the information my client provided, but at least at this time, I cannot disclose the specific information in regards to their business. But eventually, it'll make it onto my social media accounts and website at some point. I hope you gleaned some helpful information. Thank you for putting up with my rabbit trail stories. Uh, and I hope some of the information here, if it fosters any questions about anything, just post it in the comments below for this video. I'd be happy to respond. I like answering that way because other people can see it and learn stuff from those comments as well. So thank you again for watching People of Process. And as always, I hope this content helps you to improve your own creative process.